lunch, Lady Doris. Have uh, you got any grease? Yes. Yes, we do. Then grease me up, woman! Hey folks, this is Grease Scotsman. Quite a bit of time has passed since the Part 3 installment of the story and lore guide for Boneworks. Patch 1.4 brought the Redacted Chamber and the Gun Range Trial. Patch 1.5 introduced the Zombie Warehouse. Quietly tucked in with these updates were a series of lore snippets added to the game mostly by way of clipboards. A few of these communications provide corrections to the lore consensus and my own interpretations that were presented in earlier lore guides. If you have not watched the three preceding segments of this series, you will probably be very lost as I do not plan to recap concepts that were hopefully made clear in other videos. However, I will recap and try to make clear areas where new in-game information corrects or outright refutes earlier claims. Before we go any further, here is a massive spoiler warning off-ramp that includes Stress Level Zero's earlier game Duck Season and the entire story of Boneworks. Months after initial release, the Boneworks lore community continues to search and churn through the new clues left by Stress Level Zero's lore master, Alex Knoll. This video series is made possible thanks to the group's discussions and insights, and I want to express my appreciation for their feedback. And, as always, given that the multi-game universe that encases Boneworks and Duck Season is powered by the gray matter of Alex Knoll, I want to thank him for creating a world that has continued to intrigue and draw me and so many others deeper into it months after we have all finished our fateful climb to Chamber 2. The last disclaimer before we get rolling is to make clear that my references to statements made by Alex or other lore hunters during discussions found within the Boneworks lore discord channel will necessarily be missing some context since the preceding paragraphs of a longer discussion can't be easily shown in video format. Alex also often replies to lore hunters in a cryptic or playful way, so please take that into account when parsing meaning from his replies. With that said, I do have at least one lore bombshell to drop. Alex has stated that we should consider everything in the game, including all arena modes, the redacted chamber, the gun range, and the zombie warehouse, to be canonical. This has some sweeping implications, since we now need to think about Ford, presumably, experiencing these additional chambers and arenas in relation to the events of the story mode campaign. We'll revisit this revelation a bit later in greater detail. The story and lore updates from Patch 1.4 released in April 2020 included a few clipboards strewn throughout the story mode and the addition of the Redacted Chamber and Gun Range Trial. At the end of May, the time of 3.14 that had normally been displayed on the Time Tower clock looming in the distance changed to display 6.20, which coincidentally is the precise date in 1988 during which the events of Duck Season took place. However, I say coincidentally because Alex had this to say when the Boneworks lore community was speculating about the clock change. Not exactly. Time clock stuff is generally related to cryptid happenings. Could be passage length, could be the date, could be a specific time, could be a code, could be a riddle. Most importantly, in the end, he said, nobody has enough information to figure it out right now. Patch 1.5 arrived on June 18, 2020, and added several more clipboards and the zombie warehouse game modes. Alex has said that he wished most of the clipboards could have been included in the game's original release, so we should consider the order in which these messages are discovered by the player and ground them in the context of the levels in which we find them. All clipboards will be covered, even the ones that were in the game since launch, since they now weave a narrative that wasn't quite as clear in the earlier releases of the game before their inclusion. Many players probably considered Clippy to be a novelty that provided something interesting if not a little confusing to read in the opening moments of the game. However, closer examination of this clipboard reveals that this short text introduces the voidway and establishes a tie between the Void and Sentience, one of the game's major themes. The next clipboard discovered is the Monagon Internal Audit Accountability Report telling the player that Ford is being watched, and his suspicious behavior has been a concern to his superiors. This log appears to be a record of Ford's actions just moments ago, giving a clue to Monagon's extensive surveillance capabilities. We also learn that Ford is likely in contact with actors outside of Monagon, cluing the player into the rivalry between Monagon and Gammon, whose logo adorned Ford's headset and the USB device as he entered MythOS in the game's opening cutscene. Finally, the player learns that Ford is very concerned with time, like he's waiting for something to happen, which naturally will draw more attention to the looming clock tower and the cat clocks 
once they are encountered. If the player chooses to listen to Clippy's pleas and keep him alive in the opening breakroom encounter, they find him in agony in the museum near the archival offices, as he is now trapped in a display case, unable to fulfill his dreams of tracking tasks and helping people communicate. The rivalry between Gammon and Monogon is further solidified by the clipboard found in the archival room. If they weren't paying attention to the audio announcements upon entering the museum, the player also learns that MythOS is a work in progress and not yet open to the public. The Raffle Day Authorization Promotion Clipboard introduces the concept of keys, as the raffle boxes nearby grant a yellow key that will be needed later in the level. Upon reaching the cafeteria, we finally encounter a clipboard that was added after the game's initial release. The first three questions are pretty standard fare that might give an employer insight into an employee's attitude or skill set. The last question, however, asks the employee to reveal their thoughts about the possibility of communication with extra-dimensional entities. This makes sense to those of us who have completed the game or started Boneworks with a general understanding of the Voidway lore unearthed in Duck Season. But to the uninitiated, this clipboard should raise eyebrows as it hints at the world's deepening departure from the mundane. This clipboard from Mike Hayes mostly reiterates what Hayes is saying over the video communication. However, the last line gives us some really important information. Hayes claims that the Time Tower is the only known working resurrection safe location in myth. Given Ford's mission, and what I claim to be Ford's destruction or incapacitation of the system clock and Time Tower, this board hints as to why Alora is going to be so upset with Ford once she realizes the full extent of what he's doing. The Time Tower, if demolished, takes with it the last known, working, safe resurrection site. As you approach the Stress Level Zero offices in MythOS City, a clipboard mentioning the Nullmen, who are supposedly just mindless workers made to assist in the construction of MythOS, have been apparently stealing lights with the intent to grow melons. This board draws your attention to the odd and purposeful behavior carried out by these supposedly mindless beings, and focuses on the important connection between melons and the Nullmen. This clipboard, found in the SLZ offices, is authored by Alex Knoll, AK, and informs the player that the Stress Level Zero employees are working remotely due to a recent temporary office situation. It is unclear if this is a reference to real-world events that have rearranged working conditions for millions of folks, or just a way to suggest why Ford doesn't encounter any Stress Level Zero employees milling about MythOS especially given that we know SLZ has already messed with the Voidway and might be undeterred by the lockdown triggered by Ford's actions at the outset of the game. The use of backdoors or other workarounds that they have left for themselves seems likely, given their development history and what we know lies ahead in Fantasyland, just beyond the throne room. This clipboard, found after being catapulted across the gap with the Boss Claw garbage collector, has forced me to rethink a central piece of Boneworks lore. If you recall in parts 1 and 2 of this lore series, most discussion of the Void Mind AI, mentioned on the museum mural detailing the history of Monogon, was pretty dismissive. This was in part due to a fairly compelling idea from a lore hunter named Baldrick that suggested that Monogon may be using jargon about AI as a public relations scapegoat to help explain away any anomalies from the Voidway that got out of control. It was also due to the fact that, prior to these clipboards, the Voidmind AI is mentioned only once on the mural in the museum, and then never again. The only other clue before these additions came from something game director Brandon Lotch said during a Node video prior to the game's release. To, to essentially debug the clock, there's stuff going on with the clock. And so what okay. you're playing is like a visual OS that it's, it's self-generating this thing. So you start with your journey to the clock tower to go fix the clock. However, this clipboard and the other two found in this area all point to artificial intelligence as being a far more central theme of the game than was previously realized. For starters, this clipboard gauges the employee's understanding of the Turing test, developed by Alan Turing in 1950 as a way to test for a machine's or artificial being's ability to appear as intelligent as a human. In short, could the machine pass as a human? The clipboard also includes a few questions that might be included in a Turing test which raises the question whether the author of the clipboard is trying to determine if the interviewee is a human or an artificial intelligence. This is even more intriguing when I point to a comment by Alex about these seemingly easy interview questions. One of his responses was, when your job title is biological NPC, you don't have to do much. Also, it was the 90s. If social AI isn't good enough, 
hire real people to be your AI. The first question on this clipboard is pretty much a recurring joke of despair for Alex at stress level zero. When the bug fix list grows beyond measure and he's inundated with feature requests and other game development issues that force him to work to the bone, Alex often wonders if he should just give it all up and open a pizza place. The second question, however, hits on life and the corporeal. I see this question as a parallel to the messages in the break room focused on the body and the real world versus the void. It provides a somewhat philosophical inquiry into the nature of life, given that MythOS is a completely virtual environment in which organic blood has no purpose. It also seems to be an interesting question that an artificial creature might have for an organic one. The third question I was completely stumped by. At first I was thinking maybe it was a reference to From Dusk Till Dawn, or an anime, or some book I haven't yet read. I ended up just flat out asking Alex for a hint, and I'm very glad that I did. His response, it's a reference to something that doesn't exist yet. In this third clipboard in the area, the first two questions also give off a Turing test vibe, though the first question might be a slight nod toward the Saber Lake logo, which is a death's head hawk moth. I'll touch a bit more on that later. The third question hits the AI concept home, however, as it is a direct quote from the Blade Runner Voigtkampf test, used to distinguish replicants, the artificial engineered beings of that universe, from humans. Even more poignant is the fact that the reference to a tortoise in the desert has many links to myths of immortality, which match up well with themes of both Boneworks and Blade Runner. The fact that all three of these clipboards consistently hammer home the idea of artificial intelligence and the theme of distinguishing it from organic intelligence in some way has forced me to reconsider key areas of the Boneworks lore. This shift still plays well with many of the themes discussed at length in previous lore guides. For example, the only clipboard found in Runoff talks about the spread of sentience, reinforcing the poster's warning of Nullben who exhibit conscious thought, and indicates that something in Disposal may be its source. While there is no location in the game directly labeled Disposal, we do encounter the first large-scale melon fermentation operation just before reaching the trash wheel at the end of runoff, which may be the Disposal area referenced in the clipboard. Interestingly, we also find the first hints of corruption once the zombie Ford early exits awaken from their slumber. I'll have much more to say on this NPC later. Upon entering the sewers, the player is introduced to the Lava Gang. The Lava Gang is a group of real-world hackers who are responsible for most of the Boneworks mods you can find on the Bone Tome and the Melon Loader Discord channel. Alex suggested the Lava Gang name to them shortly after the game's release and then wrote them officially into the lore in Patch 1.4. The Lava Gang appears to leave the player in Edder 22's sidearm if you search the upper offices early on in the sewers level. The gift suggests that they know Ford will need it, keeping in mind that if you don't buy anything from the monomat, this is likely the first firearm to be discovered in the level. In the other offices just before the levels end, we learn that the Lava Gang is specifically responsible for teaching Nullmen how to ferment melons with void energy. The Lava Gang's purpose appears to be to hack MythOS or the Boneworks, and getting the Nullmen to work for them seems a good way to reach that goal. I want to stress that the Lava Gang only mentions the fermentation of melons, and does not reference Melon Belly. I want to take care not to conflate the two things and maintain from the previous lore guides that melons fermented in void light are responsible for the spark of sentience that null bodies experience in the game. However, Melon Belly and the apparent corruption it causes is likely something separate from that fermentation process. We need to reach the warehouse before we fully understand why this may be the case. The warehouse level's lone clipboard is a game changer, in my view as it indicates that Monogon employees are supplying the Nulls with experimental batches of melon extract. Recall that Melon Belly is made of hand-grown void melons fermented in time pods for infinity, extracted with pure light, according to the label on the bottle. Alex once referred to pure light as void light, but pure light and hand-grown melons hint at a delicate process requiring unadulterated source material. Yet, this warehouse communication reveals that Monogon employees are exploiting the Nullmen and have essentially tainted their melon source by providing them an experimental extract. Given this new information, I believe this experimental form of melon fermentation is the source of the corruption. We do not know if Melon Belly itself, when made properly, avoids triggering the corruption. However, 
Given the process described on the melon belly bottles, and the revelation that the melon extracts being supplied to the nulls may be tainted in some way, it's reasonable to guess that this experimental material is what's fueling the corruption. It also means that Monogon has inadvertently doomed Mythos City. It may also be useful to note the color and font used here, as we'll see it again in Central Station. It's unclear if there is any consistency to fonts and colors denoting authorship, but I wanted to point out the potential connection. In Central Station, the clipboard near the video communication from Alora makes clear that MythOS is being overrun by something quite alarming and has the personnel desperately calling for armed backup. The Saber Lake security forces either aren't sending backup by choice or have been overrun within the tower and cannot spare the personnel to Central Station. Given the NPCs that spill over from the tower portal at the end of the level, my guess would be that Saber Lake cannot spare the troops. In the office in the lower areas of Central Station, before reaching the quarantine door, this clipboard reveals that there is an unknown actor, a woman, who is supplying melon belly barrels to Monogon. However, the communication makes clear that the barrels are not Monogon property and aren't part of the Ultra Immersion drink brand. It is also made explicit that the logo on the barrels that many, including myself, thought was a cat, is in fact a white rabbit. Recall that previously I and other lore hunters tended to agree that Nine was the ultimate influence behind the Melon Belly corruption. Alex has very rarely chimed in during discussions in the Bone Lore channel if ideas were off base, but this course correction was so significant that there are now assets in the game to prevent players from mistakenly connecting the cat with Melon Belly. The revised lore appears to be that Melon Belly is being supplied by an outside source who is not knowingly affiliated with Monogon or Ultra Immersion. The only woman introduced throughout the Boneworks story is Alora. And she does mention Ford should be mindful of, quote, our contributions, unquote, when talking to him during the sewers level communication. That's all I'm asking for our contributions. Leave a way in. However, I hesitate to draw any clear lines connecting Alora with this unknown woman supplier of Melon Belly. We simply do not have enough information to make the link. The blue text on this clipboard appears to match that of the warehouse communication mentioned earlier, though that may simply be a coincidence. The clipboard found in the blue key room containing a myriad of crablet headsets complicates matters. This clipboard states that Saberly is misusing Monogon's headsets. The subject of the communication is also unclear. I'm unsure whether it's trying to convey that the Monogon headsets have been tampered with by Saberly and that the tampering is causing the headsets to self-assign, or are these merely a self-assigning headset model made by Monogon that Saberly is somehow misusing? I make the distinction because if Saber Lake's misuse is what is causing the headsets to become crablets, then Monogon is being exploited by their hired security forces. On the other hand, if the headsets themselves are designed by Monogon to be a crablet and Saber Lake is merely misusing them in some way, then I would view Monogon as a malicious actor, essentially imprisoning its clientele into Myth OS through the use of self-assigning headsets. Seeking clarification for this, Baldrick from the Bone Lore Discord channel astutely pointed out how the tenses in the message suggest that these headsets are a self-assigning model made by Monogon, and perhaps the misuse by Saber Lake is the headsets being set to a hostile or aggressive mode, rather than simply waiting to be worn by the user. Concerns about Saber Lake only deepen as we get further into Central Station and find this entry that claims that Monogon employees aren't even present in this part of MythOS. It is unclear if Saber Lake's dominating influence extends all the way to the tower, effectively shutting off Monogon from the core of its own system. But if that's the case, then Saber Lake is far from just a hired security force. We know very little about Saber Lake, but one of the few bits that have been discovered about them deal with their logo, a death's head hawk moth. Close examination of the Saber Lake logo found on some of the Duck Season artwork and the Saber Lake case that holds the Gammon headset Ford uses to enter MythOS shows some interesting details. If the logo is flipped upside down, the pattern that once looked like the eyes of a skull near the head of the moth look more like footprints. The pattern down the body of the moth that once seemed to be vertebrae appears instead to be arrows pointing toward a crown near the end of its abdomen. It has been suggested by some lore hunters that this design mimics Ford's journey through the Boneworks, but it may signal some other journey we'll get to take in a future game. Either way, Saber Lake's logo tells a story. The clipboard in the tower level, and all of the clipboards found after it, like the ones in the control room just after the throne encounter, are blank and will be checked for lore drops upon future updates. 
There are no clipboards in the Time Tower. However, with the new information we have about the Lava Gang's involvement with the Null Bodies, the events that transpired there take on additional meaning. In previous guides, I speculated, due to the incorrect connections between Nine, Melon Belly, and the Corruption, that Nine may be the one controlling the Nulls here. The thread that connected them was based on Nine's message to David in Duck Season, where Nine indicates a desire to free others, and considering that SLZ is mucking with the Voidway and David being tricked into completing a puzzle, opened a gate allowing Nine's escape, the idea seemed reasonable at the time, though I was clearly out on a limb. However, recall that Mike Hayes sent forth a message near the end of Tower, letting him know that the Nullmen were acting strangely around the clock in Time Tower, pulling cores from it in what Hayes thought might be an attempt to open a void gate. Something is definitely controlling the Nullmen. They're pulling gravity cores from the system clock, maybe to open some kind of void gate? I, I don't know. The Null bodies in the level appeared to be uncorrupted, and we don't really have a way of determining if they were conscious, or even if they were doing the bidding of the Lava Gang. The only hint they may have been was due to Hayes' confusion and surprise by their behavior. If the Nulls were acting at the behest of the Lava Gang, then it appears that the group has an interest in opening a Void Gate. Hopefully it's been made clear that the Clipboard lore additions, if I have interpreted them correctly, have shifted the events of the main story considerably. Let's finally turn to the new game modes and chambers added in patches 1.4 and 1.5. It is important to make clear that while Alex has stated that these game modes and chambers are canonical, we don't know the timing of Ford's interaction with them, or if our Ford is the iteration of Ford to experience them. I believe the only potential grounding that suggests a common thread or continuity is the fact that the modules get added to the main menu. Before diving into the redacted chamber, it's important to lay out a key concept of its gameplay, recursion loops. Doing so will also allow us to come full circle and address the central theme of this guide, artificial intelligence. When you complete the chamber, you are awarded with the achievement recursion, recursion through redacted. Let's break down recursion loops as the term is likely only familiar to folks with a coding background. Let's start with basic iterative loops. In programming, a loop simply performs some grouped lines of code, often called a block of code, as many times as is specified in the program. In other words, if you wanted to count to 10 by two, instead of writing out several math equations like this, two plus zero equals two, two plus two equals four, and so on until you get to two plus eight equals 10, you could instead write something like this, say in JavaScript, variable x equals zero. While x is less than 10, set x equal to two plus the current value of x, and then write out the result using a document write statement. In this case, the curly braces denote our block of code. Any lines of code found between these braces get repeatedly executed. We're simply running this same bit of code over and over to add two to x, and then write out the result. The usefulness of the loop doesn't seem very obvious in this simple case, as it takes most humans about as long to write out the equations as it would be to write the code with the loop. However, now imagine that we wanted to count to 8,000 by twos. All of a sudden, the idea of writing out two plus whatever 4,000 times seems silly and time consuming. Yet, using a loop, we only need to change the condition of when to end, like so, while x is less than 8,000. Everything else stays the same, but now our loop will count by twos all the way to 8,000 and print out the results of each iteration. Hopefully this example illustrates the power of loops and why coders nerd out about them. So that's a standard iterative loop where we specify the start and end conditions beforehand. In each case, before the loop was executed, there was a check to see if the conditions were met, while x was less than 10. If x was less than 10, the code ran. As soon as x was greater or equal to 10, the code did not run. Now let's define a recursion loop. A recursion loop is a loop that calls itself and does not necessarily need the start and end parameters defined. The only information a recursion loop needs is the desired value or outcome being sought. In other words, loop until we have the information we need. The info being sought is often called the base case. A good example of when to use a recursion loop would be something like solving for mathematical factorials, where you use the answer of the previous multiplied values to help solve the current step in the sequence. Here's a general look at what the code might look like to solve for any factorial of an integer. If this looks like a bunch of nonsense, don't worry about it. The key takeaway to understand here 
is that recursive functions call themselves. However, if the base condition is never met, that means the loop will literally execute forever. This is usually not a good thing when it comes to actual programming, and it takes resources, like the memory of your computer, to continually loop through sets of code, and if that code is designed poorly or intentionally to never end, then the amount of memory used by the looping program grows and grows indefinitely, leading to memory leaks, errors, and program crashes. In the context of Boneworks, you can see why a geek like me got really excited as soon as I realized what was happening in the redacted chamber. Thankfully, Stress Level Zero is a merciful crew, and Ford only needs to loop or recurse through the redacted chamber about three or four times until the base case, the appearance of the gun range module, and the cycle can be exited the next time Ford reaches the welcome home door. However, you'll notice that with each iteration, the enemies are more abundant, some of the items change, and the level becomes a bit more chaotic, signaling perhaps an instability or corruption in the loop that's being executed in MythOS Test Chamber 4. Stepping away from code, loops, and iterations for that matter, it's also worth mentioning that through a crack in the wall of the redacted chamber, we see Jimmy Wong, who was the source of the placeholder player model very early in Boneworks development. As a quick aside, Jimmy Wong will likely star in Dead FM based on the concept art that has been unearthed for that project. So why are loops so important here? Let's zoom out and examine an extremely basic outline of artificial intelligence. The easiest way to describe how AI works is to say that it is a general framework of algorithms that get fed enormous amounts of data. It iterates or loops through that data over and over and over, looking for patterns and testing different permutations that will help with its decision-making process. It does this so many times that eventually it arrives at very efficient results or strategies, including ones that haven't been considered by humans. This is one of the reasons why Deep Blue, IBM's early chess-playing computer, and its spiritual successor, DeepMind's AlphaZero, are so noteworthy. AlphaZero, for example, is the chess-playing AI that, with a mere 24 hours of training, was able to defeat every human chess champion pitted against it and demolished other AI opponents that had longer but more rigid forms of training. In everyday language, iterate tends to just mean to repeat a process. But in mathematics or programming, an iteration, especially when talking about recursion, is often defined even further to mean to repeat a process and use the result or whatever was learned from the previous run in order to improve upon the current attempt. Consider our 2 plus x example, where we kept plugging in the answer for x of the previous equation in order to get the next value of x. And now, dear viewer, I ask that you take a leap with me. With this concept of loops and iterating and constantly refining things until you get closer and closer to the goal, let's apply this idea to Ford's entire journey through Boneworks. Recall all of the messages strewn throughout the game with hints on how to solve puzzles, the encouraging messages telling Ford to push onward. Think of all the times Ford failed, but left behind warnings of danger ahead, allowing the next iteration of Ford to get just a little further. This idea of refinement is even manifest as you collect ammo within the game. Your best ammo run through prior levels becomes the next level's starting amount. The Boneworks journey itself fits within the context of a recursion loop, where the base case is reaching the void and obtaining immortality, and Ford is continually refining his efforts to reach that goal. Much is still unknown about what is truly going on. For example, it is still unclear how to resolve the fact that Ford is shown as being a real person in the cutscenes, and yet appears to have some alternate version of Ford meet him in runoff. However, Alex has suggested, when talking in general terms about the Void, that we're dealing with multiple and alternate dimensions or realities. Unfortunately, I don't think there is enough concrete information about the Voidway and its inner workings to do anything more than indulge in wild speculations about how this conundrum gets resolved. I have a hunch that it will involve the clock tower and, given what we know about the roles of the Boneworks team, the destabilization of space-time that has likely been triggered by Ford's shenanigans. But since the evidence is lacking, we should let those questions rest and simply say that we do not yet know. Setting this brain teaser aside, we turn to patch 1.5 and the zombie warehouse. Lockdown is interesting as it begins and ends with a cat clock that appears to taunt you with a powerful weapon at the mode's end. Obtaining the dev manipulator only after you would have need for it keeps in line with the trickster cryptid motif, especially considering that the only way to end the level is to kill yourself. 
Two of the other game modes don't appear to have any strong lore relevance. However, in my mind, the most significant mode from a lore perspective is Cure. Throughout the story, the only NPCs wearing a VR headset are the zombies jamming to the Beatson Tower. Keep in mind that the VR junkie Ford, who is hostile to Ford in the sandbox modes and sometimes wears a headset, never actually shows up within the story. It is true that the VR junkie Ford model without a VR headset appears at the start of runoff, but that Ford's behavior appears to be both friendly and helpful. As stated in part two, Alex has made clear that we will need to wait for additional lore drops, and likely even entirely new games, before we learn more about this strange, helpful, yet hairless Ford at runoff's outset. We know now that the Lava Gang is responsible for teaching the Nulls to ferment melons. However, they specifically say melons and not melon belly. We've also learned that the barrels of melon belly adorned with a rabbit logo are actually being supplied by some unknown woman who isn't openly affiliated with Monogon or Ultramersion. The new information found in the warehouse tells us that the melon extract being provided to the Nulls by Monogon employees is experimental and potentially tainted. Recall the rudimentary fords encountered in the dungeon level, which I labeled husk fords in earlier guides, because they appeared to be fords that were missing something. I agree with the lore consensus view that these fords were empty rigs, left behind after Ford's consciousness crossed into the voidway. With those pieces on the board, let's now turn our attention back to the Voidmind AI. According to the museum's information wall, the Voidmind AI strives to create an infinitely expanding virtual space for work, education, and life. The rig, also described in the museum as the Monogon Supplied Body UI, that allows for metaphysical connection between virtual and void storage. It's the avatar that a real-world person uses to interact with MythOS. What if these Husk Ford rigs are animated by the Void Mind AI once Ford's consciousness vacates the shell? For one thing, that would help explain why, in addition to the lockdown caused by the void leaks, there are only Ford rigs in MythOS and Fantasyland, where presumably there was not a lockdown. It also helps explain the learning experience on display at the start of the dungeon level, where the husk forward that greets you needs to spend some time mimicking your actions until they are able to wave their arms and walk on their own. Finally, it also points to a reason why Monogon clipboards are asking prospective employees Turing test questions that try to distinguish between artificial intelligence and humans. Either the Voidmind AI is using the responses to enrich its data so it can behave more human-like, or Monogon is concerned it won't be able to distinguish between AI-controlled NPCs and Myth's human inhabitants. Brandon from SLZ once referred to zombie fords as a form of corruption in an early Node video. So these guys are a, a corruption within the system, okay? I'll say no more. And it stands to reason that zombie fords and the corrupted Nullmen result when they imbibe batches of melon belly that appears to have been made with an experimental form of melon extract. In the zombie warehouse, the Cure game mode reveals an unambiguous line between zombie fords and these husk fords. Upon successfully completing the Cure, the player is able to remove the corruption, reverting the zombie fords back to husk fords. On occasion, these cured fords will even exclaim, It's you! which suggests that these husks recognize you as being special. This mode and the Husk Ford's reactions offer some additional insight as to why our Ford seems to be revered when reaching the dungeon and throne room levels. Recall in part three that themes of emancipation were established for both Husk Fords and the Nullmen. The Cure game mode carries this concept forward and better explains the stained glass depictions of our Ford with a halo. Similarly, for each iteration, the Husk Fords worship the system clock because it acts as a harbinger of our Ford's arrival. There are still many questions left to answer, but I'm concerned we do not yet have enough information to safely come to meaningful conclusions about those questions. So I'll end the guide here until we get our next lore drop. As always, I want to thank the Stress Level Zero team for creating such an amazing game and offer my appreciation to the members of the Bone Lore Discord channel for the continued support and feedback that makes these guides possible. 
For those thirsting for more, we still have two doors enveloped by pockets of the void awaiting us in the sewers level. Alex has stated clearly that these doors do not yet reveal anything. There are no hidden tricks to unlocking them as of patch 1.5, but you can rest assured as each new update is released, I, along with an army of like-minded lore hunters in the Boneworks community, will be checking them along with every other nook and corner of the game for hints that might fill in the gaps and answer the questions that remain. Until then, dear viewer, thanks for tuning in.